right that's one minute past I'm going to be punctual today going to kick start um welcome everybody who's attended today it's we're delighted to kick start our next series in the FS Academy um just a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. As usual, um, <clears throat> this is just a quick snapshot, 30 minutes. We don't have time for questions. So please do um, keep your cameras and off and keep yourself on mute. And if you've got any questions, um, just uh, get in touch with the speakers after the event. We'll be delighted to engage and, and answer any questions that you have. Um, the as usual, the um, Zoom meeting will be recorded and that will be distributed at the end of the series along with the other um, recordings as well. So um, welcome everybody. As I say, we're, we're delighted to host you. My name is Caroline Stevenson and I head up the Financial Services Regulatory Team here at Burness Paul. Uh, I'm delighted today to be joined by um, two superstar solicitors in my team, Marianne Mornin and Sylvia Matheson. They'll each introduce themselves briefly before they kickstart. Um, the topic today which is payments and um, as you know the FS Academy series is really just meant to be sort of a snapshot um, a quick introductory session just getting you up to speed with key concepts and themes and for payments that's going to include quite a lot of acronyms because there's quite a lot of acronyms um, payments is a huge part of our practice here at, in the team at Burness Paul and there's so much we could cover so today we're really just going to try and focus on sort of the basics just so you can get an understanding of what payments involves and what type of um, products and services are covered by that. So without more ado I'm delighted to pass over to Marianne Mernon who's going to be our first speaker today and I think also she this is the first time you um, in the audience who are familiar with the series will have met her. So over to you Marianne. Thank you Caroline for the introduction. Um, so Yes, I'm a solicitor in the FS Reg team, and this is my first um, FS Academy webinar, so nice to meet you all, and thanks for joining. Um, so as Caroline mentioned, this is very much an introductory session geared at um, giving a high-level overview of the payments and electronic money regulatory regime in the UK. Um, so in order to set the scene, I'm going to kick off the session by discussing exactly what payments and e-money are, and then I'll look um, at the relevant regulators and regulations within this sector. So to begin, what exactly are payments? Um, well, it might sound really obvious because even though we're used to making payments on a daily basis, probably more than we should, um, not everyone realises how, how many different types of payments firms that are out there. I know that I certainly didn't before I was an FS Reg lawyer. Um, and what makes this space so interesting is that there's always new firms cropping up as people look for more efficient ways to make payments and manage their money. So to set the scene, I'll briefly go through a few of the different types of payment firms which you might come across. And these are set out on the slide. Um, so to begin, we have merchant acquiring firms or merchant acquirers which are financial institutions which will have a relationship with a merchant or retailer in order to enable them to process their customers' credits and debit card transactions when they purchase goods or services, and they'll collect the payment on their behalf. So examples of merchant acquirers would be companies such as WorldPay and Stripe. We also have money remittance firms. Um, which is essentially a business involving the process of taking funds from a payer and passing them on to a payee or that payee's payment service provider. An example would be MoneyGram or Western Union. We have card issuers, which includes non-bank credit card issuers, um, which would include firms such as Aqua, the credit builder card, which you might have heard of. Um, we also have account information service providers, and these are companies which allow you to see all of your payment account information from different bank accounts in the one place. Um, so a good example are companies which offer budget planning apps such as Mint or Emma. And then finally, the last on the slide is um, another type of firm called or known as uh, firms known as payment initiation service providers. And these essentially offer alternative ways for customers to pay for goods or services. Um, so when using a payment initiation service, consumers give consent for a third party to connect to their bank account and they'll initiate the payment on their behalf without the need to input uh, card details. An example of this is PayIt, which is offered by NatWest. And the last two I've discussed are forms of open banking, which have been brought into the scope of regulation in recent years. 
Um, so separate to payment service firms, we have electronic money institutions or EMIs, and these offer um, e-money services. So what exactly is electronic money? We'll look at the definition under the regulations shortly. However, essentially e-money is prepaid money stored electronically on cards, devices or online systems and used for the purpose of making payment transactions. Um, and e -money, this includes online services, which you likely have heard of, such as PayPal, Revolut and Tide. Um, E-money is subject to a slightly different regulatory regime from payment service providers, which we will come on to. But first, I wanted to set out who the regulators are. So the primary regulator for e-money and payment services is the FCA. The FCA has responsibility for authorising firms to carry on regulated payment and e-money services and supervises their compliance with the regulations. And if firms don't comply, then the FCA can impose fines and sanctions. There's also the Payment Systems Regulator, which is an independent subsidiary of the FCA. It was established um, by the Financial Services Banking Reform Act back in 2013, with the intention of increasing competition in the payment sector. So it was set up specifically to regulate payment systems operated by payment scheme companies. Um, so companies which are currently within its scope are BACs, CHAPS, Visa and MasterCard, amongst others. The Payment Systems Regulator has the power to set standards and issue directions, and it can sanction firms for non-compliance. Um, it's worth mentioning also that there's also the European Banking Authority, the U EBA, which regulates and supervises the European banking sector, including the payment sector. I won't go into detail, um, but it's helpful to know that although the EBA no longer directs payment services in the UK due to Brexit, some of its guidance and principles are still relevant. And then I also just wanted to mention that um, the Bank of England is also relevant in this sphere um, due to its role um, in maintaining monetary and financial stability. So next, um, let's take a look at the regulations which apply. The two primary sets of legislation for payments and e-money are the Payment Services Regulations 2017, also known as the PSRs. And then we have the Electronic Money Regulations 2011, known as the EMRs. The PSRs and EMRs given, uh, govern the authorization and associated requirements for payment institutions or electronic money institutions. They set out what services are in the scope of the regulations, and they also provide a list of exclusions. Many e-money issuers will be carrying on payment services in addition to, using, to issuing e-money, so they'll need to be familiar with both sets of regulations. So let's turn firstly to the PSRs. Um, these apply with certain exceptions to everyone who provides payment services as a regular occupation or business activity in the UK. So in part one, schedule one of the regulations, you'll find a list of activities which fall into its scope. Um, so let's take a look at what activities are regulated. So under schedule one, the regulated payment services are cash placed on or withdrawn from a payments account and the operation of the payments account. We also have executing payment transactions. So this would involve a payment service provider executing a transfer of funds from its customer to a payee's payment service provider. We have money remittance, which as mentioned earlier, involves funds being passed from a payer to a payee. And the difference between executing payments and money remittance is that with money remittance, there are no payment accounts created in the name of the payer or payee. We also have issuing payment instruments, which essentially involves the issuing of a credit or debit card. There's acquiring payment transactions, um, which is a process of accepting and processing the payment transactions of retailers or merchants and settling funds to those merchants. And then lastly, we have payment initiation services and account information services, which as discussed earlier, are open banking services. So um, those are the activities which are regulated. There are, however, a broad range of exclusions which are expressly set out in part two of, the sh of schedule one of the regulations. And this slide sets out a few of those. Um, there are more exceptions to this and I couldn't list them all, but um, yes, if you want to see them all, then you should um, go to part two of schedule one of the regs. 
So firstly, we have an exclusion for transactions executed wholly in cash or on paper directly between the payer and the payee. So this would include the use of checks or vouchers. We also have what's known as the commercial agent exclusion. Um, so this covers payment transactions made through commercial agents acting on behalf of either the payer or the payee. We have the ATM exemption, which is an exemption for cash withdrawal services provided from an ATM, where the provider of that ATM has no relationship with the customer withdrawing money. There's an exemption for cash to cash currency exchange activities, for example, a bureau de change. Um, there is a cashback exemption, so the activity of offering a cashback service to customers when they pay for their goods at the checkout would not fall within the scope of the regs. Um, there is an exemption also for technical service providers, which simply provide IT support for the provision of payment services. So this would include um, activities like data processing, storage and authentication, and these will not constitute a payment service. There's also the limited network exclusion. So this is quite important. Um, it applies to payment instruments which allow the holder to acquire goods or services in the issuer's premises only, can only be used within a limited network of services and can only be used to acquire a very limited range of goods or services. So this would cover, for example, store cards where the card can only be used at the issuer's premises or website. And then finally, we have the electronic communications exclusion which includes payment transactions for certain goods or services up to certain value limits, resulting from services provided by a provider of electronic communications networks or services. So let's move on now to look at the electronic money regulations, also known as the EMRs. So regulation two, one of the EMRs provides a definition of electronic money. And it defines it as electronically, including magnetically stored monetary value, as represented by a claim on the electronic money issuer, which is issued on receipt of funds for the purpose of making payment transactions, accepted as a means of payment by a person other than the e-money issuer, and is not caught by one of the exemptions within the regulations. And the two express exclusions are found in regulation three of the EMRs. Um, these are known as the limited network exclusion and the electronic communication communications exclusion. I won't go into detail about these as they pretty much mirror the, um, the, the limited network exclusion and electronic communications exclusions within the PSRs. Um, but it's worth mentioning that, again, the limited network exclusion means that prepaid cards used for a limited purpose only, such as in a single retail chain, um, cars used in an office canteen or prepaid travel cards would fall outside the scope of the regulation. And it's also worth mentioning that credit cards are excluded from the definition of e-money because unlike credit provided for a credit card with e-money, the customer pays for the spending power in advance. So that brings us on to the last slide um, in my part of the presentation. And um, I'm going to briefly discuss other types of legislation, other legislation to be aware of. So while the PSRs and EMRs are primary pieces of legislation governing payments and e-money, um, there are other sets of legislation which might be relevant to certain firms. This slide by no means cover, cover it all, but it might give some background as to kind of what to, what to think about. So there is the payment account regulations which apply to firms which provide current accounts, current accounts to consumers um, and require those firms to provide certain standardised information on fees in order to allow consumers to compare different account products. There is interchange fee regulations which set out obligations for payment service providers dealing in card-based payments. And these govern the amount of a fee that an issuer can charge to an acquirer for customers using their card under a payment scheme. We've got the SEPA regulations, which are um, relevant in the Euro context. So these harmonize retail payments across the EU to enable quick and efficient payments. And the UK has maintained its SEPA membership um, despite Brexit. And then finally, there is a money laundering regs, um, which all payment service providers and e-money issuers must comply with to counter the risk that they're misused for the purposes of money laundering and terrorist financing. And then briefly at the end of the, uh, end of the slide, I've just set out two kind of useful manuals and um, guidance documents to refer to if you want to know exactly, if you want to know more about exactly which activities um, fall within the scope of the regulations and which ones are exempt. Um, so we've got PERG, 
in the FCA handbook and chapter 15 is a relevant, um, relevant chapter to look at. And we've also got the FCA payment services and e-money approach document, which goes into a lot of detail as to how the FCA expects firms to comply with the rules. So hopefully that was helpful in setting the scene um, and I'll now pass you to Sylvia, who's going to discuss safeguarding and future developments in the regulatory landscape. Thanks, Marianne. Um, so just to give you a quick introduction, I'm Sylvia, I'm a solicitor in Burness Paul's financial services regulatory team. So, and if you joined our FS Academy Spring Series, you would have seen me and it's good to be, to be back for the Autumn Series. So now Marianne has given us a comprehensive overview of payment services and e-money, the key legislation to be aware of and the nuances around this sector. I'm going to pick up on an area which continues to be a priority item for regulators. As Marianne had mentioned, it, um, it's safeguarding, safeguarding around payment services and e-money. And the reason we see it continuing to be a focus area for the regulator is that payment services and e-money are high growth areas. We're seeing ever evolving business models, fast moving technology, not to mention high volumes of consumer funds. This explains why regulators are concerned with any perceived lack of consumer protection or lack of robust prudential requirements for these non-bank service providers. So safeguarding requirements are in place to ensure that firms protect customer funds by creating a segregated asset pool of relevant funds from which to pay the claims of e-money holders or payment service users. And these will be in priority to other creditors if the payment services provider goes into insolvency. So what are the safeguarding requirements for e-money firms and payment service providers? Well, these are governed by the electronic money regulations, the EMRs, and the payment services regulations, the PSRs, as Marianne has already given us an intro to. And under both sets of these regulations, any identified what is known as relevant funds will be sub subject to the safeguarding requirements under either the EMRs or the PSRs. So at a high level, relevant funds under the e-money regs are funds that have been received in exchange for money that has been issued. Under the payment services regulations, relevant funds include funds received from or for the benefit of a payment service user or on behalf of for the execution of a payment transaction. It's worth noting that in both instances, relevant funds can be received from third parties, for example, a client of the payment service user. So the next question is who has to comply with safeguarding requirements? Well, small and small payment institutions are not obligated to meet the safeguarding requirements. However, there's the option for these small PIs to comply voluntarily, and many will as they're looking to upscale, it paves the way for future expansion. Although any opt-in that they do choose to do voluntarily will have to comply with safeguarding requirements and it would need to be notified to the FCA and also in annual reporting returns. Large payment institutions are required to meet the safeguarding requirements and any size authorised e-money institutions are also required to meet the safeguarding requirements. So now we know who has to comply, but what do firms actually need to do? So there are two ways, firstly, segregation, secondly, insurance or comparable guarantee. Under segregation, relevant funds will be held separately from any other funds a firm holds, and at the end of the day, must either be deposited, deposited in a segregated account, which must be with an authorised bank or the Bank of England, or if it's not deposited in a segregated account, the funds can be invested in an FCA approved, an FCA approved liquid assets held with an authorised custodian. The FCA is made clear that under no circumstances should funds be kept together overnight. So that's segregation, one form of safeguarding. The other form is by insurance or a compatible guarantee. And this would involve the payment institution or e-money institution to be covered by an insurance policy with an authorised insurer or a guarantee with a credit institution. Safeguarding doesn't stop there. E-money institutions and payment institutions are expected to conduct ongoing oversight and management, including ensuring adequate internal controls are in place to manage effective accounting, oversight and risk management. 
an appropriate individual with sufficient experience and knowledge should be appointed to oversee the systems and controls in place. And firms are also expected to carry out reconciliations. Both internal and exter external reconciliations should be performed to verify that the funds held as safeguarded match with the firm's records. This, of course, involves keeping accurate and timely records of safeguarded funds. And the FCA has clarified that an institution should carry out internal and external reconciliations as often as necessary, considering the risks to which that particular business is exposed. And there's also a requirement under both the payment services regulations and the e-money regulations for an annual audit to be carried out. This isn't a new requirement, but there was some ambiguity and the FCA clarified in 2020 the need for an annual audit. And that audit should be carried out by an audit firm or by another independent external firm or consultant. So that's the safeguarding requirements which apply. As I mentioned, this continues to be a focus area for the FCA when it comes to payments and e-money. And I'm now going to look ahead to what's on the horizon for payments and e-money. There's a lot going on in this space. The ways of making payments and moving money around are evolving and the real challenge for regulators is to ensure their ability to keep up with the pace of change and to be able to put in a place a regulatory framework that can properly manage evolving risks and ensure that the, the system is working well and for the benefit of stakeholders. So moving on to the recently closed HMT consultation on payments regulation and the systemic perimeter, um, which we've noted there on the slide. This consultation opened in July this year and closed just last month on the 11th of October. The Treasury consulted and called for evidence on the government's approach to reforms to the payments regulatory landscape and one of its main proposals was to extend the systemic payments perimeter of the Bank of England. So Marianne, Marianne has helpfully introduced us to the regulators at the start of the session and the Bank of England is one such regulator in this space. To give a bit of background on the systemic payments perimeter of the Bank of England, the Treasury has the power under the Banking Act 2009 to recognise a payment system as systemically important, resulting in that payment system being subject to supervision by the Bank of England. And this supervision requirement is in keeping with the Bank of England's role of ensuring the stability of the UK financial services system. The Treasury can also recognise associated service providers who may not necessarily be payment systems themselves, but their role alongside payment systems is such that a disruption would pose a risk to the UK's financial stability. The consultation sets out proposals on how this current regulatory perimeter should be expanded to bring a wider category of payment firms deemed to be systemic within the Bank of England supervision. The government is proposing to do this by extending the Banking Act 2009 to include an additional category of payments providers. The proposal is that this would cover firms within payment chains that pose systemic risk in their own right. So the, the, the feature of this new category is that the risk is linked to the provider itself, not its relationship with an already recognised payment system. And it would capture firms that perform a crucial role in payments, so much so that any disruption could have a material impact on the financial stability of the market. We don't yet know what type of firms would be caught under this new category, potentially large payment processors, facilitators, pass-through digital wallets. What we do know that is that some payment firms which are not currently subject to regulation may in the future be subject to regulatory oversight and we would expect the Treasury to set out the criteria which would inform such a categorisation. If the systemic payments perimeter is extended as proposed, this could mean dual supervision for firms by both the Bank of England and the FCA. This would be applicable to those firms which are already authorised under payment services or e-money frameworks and are subject to conduct and prudential supervision by the FCA. So moving on to another proposal in the recent consultation. The consultation propose, proposes providing the FCA with a general rulemaking power for payments and e-money. 
there's an intention is that this power would mean that the frameworks can be amended much quicker than under the current arrangements, which would allow the FCA to react quickly to market trends and any emerging risks in the payments and e-money sector. How far the FCA is allowed to go in terms of refor reforming the current payments framework and any potential divergence from retained EU legislation will need to be fleshed out. Another proposal in the consultation that I wanted to, to discuss is the proposed amendments to the senior managers and certification regime, which I'll refer to as SMCR because it's a little bit easier. Um, so we, and I mean by we, I mean the financial services regulatory team here at Barnes Paul, we gave an overview of SMCR in our winter series last year. So if you wanted to know more about that, I'd recommend watching back that recording. But just to give you a quick overview just now of the regime, the SMCR is the framework applicable to individuals working for firms regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, and the Prudential Regulation Authority, the PRA. And there are three key elements to SMCR. There's the senior managers regime, the certification regime, the conduct rules. So those are the three limbs, it's a very quick overview. But coming back onto the consultation, the government is proposing that SMCR be extended to include recognised payment entities within the Bank of England's regulatory perimeter. So it would encompass those payment entities which we've discussed, which fall within the Bank of England's regulatory perimeter. The consultation also seeks views on whether the SMCR could cater for a differentiated treatment of the various actors in a way that would be commensurate to the firm's size, reach and risk profile. And the FCA has also indicated its approval for extending SMCR, advocating that extending the SMCR to the payments and e-money sector could enhance individual accountability and governance within firms and also strengthen the FCA's ability to supervise such firms by providing the regulator with a wider range of tools to drive higher standards and mitigate consumer harm related risks. And that's everything I wanted to speak about in terms of the consultation on payments regulation and the systemic perimeter. Um, I've just got a couple of minutes. I'm going to very quickly look at the recent proposals for dealing with auth authorised push payments, APP fraud. Again, this is something you may already have heard us discussing in our FS Academy Spring Series. And it would seem remiss not to discuss APP fraud in the context of payments. So firstly, what is APP? An authorised push payment is where a payer, often an individual consumer, instructs their payment service provider to send funds from their account to another. These payments are typically executed via CHAPS or faster payment service. An APP fraud is where the payer is tricked into making an APP to an account controlled by someone who's not the intended recipient and fraudster. An APP fraud has risen significantly in very recent years. In the first half of 2021, cases rose by 71%. And for the first time, this type of fraud overtook card fraud in terms of the amount of money stolen. So in response, the Payment Systems Regulator published a consultation in September this year, which closes later on this month, setting out proposals for dealing with APP scams. A key proposal is to require payment service providers to be mandated to reimburse customers who fall subject to an APP fraud scam, noting that there would be limited exceptions, such as where the consumer is involved in the fraud themselves or where they have acted with gross negligence. And also proposes that the sending payment service provider, so that being the provider of the account the payment is made from, will have to reimburse the victim as soon as possible and no more than 40 hours from the fraud being reported. Additional time would be granted if the PSP had evidence or reasonable grounds to suspect fraud on the part of the consumer or gross negligence. And the regulator notes that currently of those payment service providers who already reimburse customers, it's generally the, generally the sending PSP which picks up the cost of reimbursement. And the consultation proposes that reimbursement should be shared equally between the sending and receiving payment service providers 
although firms are permitted to use a dispute management process to adjust the allocation between them, which can be reflective of the steps each firm took to prevent the scam. So on the face of it, this is welcome news for consumers. However, as payment service providers grapple with putting the necessary procedures in place to mitigate their potential losses, this could mean a step back for consumers in terms of the ease in which payments could be made, especially those of high value. It's also more likely to impact on smaller payment service providers and new entrants to the market. It's certainly something we will be keeping an eye on in the coming weeks and months. So I've just gone a minute over, um, but with that, I'll bring, I'll bring to the end the first session of our FS Academy Autumn Series. It's good to be back. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, please do join us next week. Our next session is on enforcement and compliance. So we'll be looking at what tools the regulator has when it comes to taking action against firms for non-compliance. In the meantime, do get in touch if you have any questions, queries, and we will hopefully see you next week. Thank you.